everybody. Um, there we go, except for me. That's good. So I think everyone is currently muted. Um, we're going to record tonight's um, um, presentation. As we, uh, we have heard that there is um, an area of Tweedsmuir that has no broadband for whatever reason tonight. Um, and there have been one or two disappointed um, people who were hoping to attend. So at least if we record it, that they, they can watch um, at their own convenience. It will be shared um, and available for anybody else who wants to watch it. So should you not wish to be seen on the screen, obviously um, you can hide your camera. However, when Kenny's presenting, it, it will just be Kenny's screen that you see. So you won't, you won't be full screen um, at the front. So I've muted everybody. And if I can ask, um, if you stay muted during the presentation, just so that we don't have um, children shouting in the Mom, background, um, children shouting in the background or the doorbell ringing or the dogs barking, just so that um, you don't have to be embarrassed if something happens in your house. Um, what else do I need to say, Aidan? Is that all I need to tell people? Don't ask me! <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask um, Duncan if he will introduce tonight's speaker for us. Um, if you have any questions while Kenny is speaking, if I can ask you to type them in the chat or wave at us or whatever, and then we can ask you to unmute. Um, we're hoping that our broadband speed all um, keeps up and Kenny's voice stays in tune with his um, slides, which, which can be a challenge if broadband starts to go slow. Um, so you may see me waving um, or, or unmuting myself if I think Kenny's speaking faster than the internet's allowing him to. Um, so we'll put the questions in chat. We can stop at any time and, and ask questions, but there'll be time at the end if you want to save any sort of more general questions to the end of the talk. Um, but I hope you're all comfortable. It was actually a lovely day today, not like our usual Zoom talk evenings, but a lovely day today, but quite nice not to have to go every, anywhere tonight. So I am going to pass over to Duncan. So Duncan, you could just unmute at the moment because I've muted you um, to introduce our speaker, please. We will do that. Yeah, yeah, well. Hello. Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks, Duncan. We okay, can great. Well, I'm delighted to welcome Kenny to this. Um, uh, many of you will know Kenny, but he, he's, he's a um, multi-award winning photographer. Um, lots of uh, um, awards and activities and interests in photography. So he's, both, he's a very skilled photographer. And not, more, not only that, he's a teacher of photography. Really throughout the world, we were talking to him uh, earlier and he's really been more or less all around the world doing uh, teaching in photography. So we have a great photographer, we have a great teacher, and I welcome him to tell us how we can improve our photography, our 10 tips to improve your photography. Kenny. Unmute me, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, good. <laughs> lots, lots of nodding. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, Duncan and Leslie for that introduction um, and thank you very much for everybody joining uh, me here tonight uh, for this little um, short um, talk about 10 ways to improve your photography and I kind of realised that it's difficult to do this type of talk because everybody is on different levels. In fact, some people you know, wouldn't even class themselves as an amateur photographer. They've just got a, an iPhone or whatever. So I'm going to try and keep it as um, untechnical as possible um, because I, I could just be talking in riddles to some people. And um, it's kind of practical things that can help you um, just take better pictures. And um, they're all kind of common sense. Some of them are photographically based, but a lot of them are just about 
you know, stopping and thinking a little bit before you actually take the picture. And there's a little section on that actually <clears throat> with some examples. So um, what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to share the screen and hopefully um, everyone be, will be able to see um, my screen in a second. <clears throat> Start broadcast. Okay. And so the first question is, can everybody see that <clears throat> screen? Anybody unmute themselves and tell me. <laughs> yes, we can see that. Thank you, Kenny. Yeah. The Tweedsmere community talks on Zoom. That's fantastic. Yeah. And that's a picture of me for anybody that doesn't know me in the bottom corner there. And I guess what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to um, I'm trying to get you to um, be in control, more in control of your photography, be more in control of um, your, your image making. And um, because so many people just kind of, you know, see something and point, to, point the, the camera or the iPhone uh, in, in that vague direction and take a picture. And, and that's not really the way to do it. So um, 10 ways to, 10 simple ways to improve your photography. Um, as Duncan has said, I'm not going to go into too much of this, but I've been doing photography now for over 35 years and I've lectured all over the world on it. And at the minute, I'm actually <clears throat> not taking so many pictures. I'm actually a photographic mentor and consultant and I travel around um, helping other studios um, towards success. So that's that's kind of where I'm just now. Um, but I'm a, I'm a kind of passionate photographer because I'm a general practitioner photographer. Uh, and generally what that means is I photograph, um, I, I photograph absolutely everything. So there's lots of photographers who specialize in, let's say, portraits or photographing glass or photographing food um, or weddings indeed. And um, I, I do everything. So basically, if I get a call to say, can you photograph, uh, you know, some new kitchens, I can do it. Or, you know, could you go and do this type of portrait? I, I can do it. So um, I'm what you would class as a GP photographer. And I'm also a passionate amateur photographer as well. So, um, uh, so that, that's where I'm kind of coming from. Now, let me just explain something. <clears throat> What I'm going to be talking about just now has got nothing at all to do with the actual camera that you're using. It's all to do with the person who's actually behind the camera and the skill of that person to be able to, to, be able to see and to be able to um, tell their viewers what they want to tell them through the power of photography. And it doesn't matter if you're using a, a, an iPhone, you know, which everybody's got, or an analog, which everybody's got in their um, uh, in their possession almost at all times, which makes it the best camera out there. Or, or, or whether it's a Hasselblad professional camera, it doesn't matter in the slightest what kind of camera you're using. In fact, last month I did an article for Camera Craft magazine, and that article was based entirely on that. The camera that you've got with you is the best camera. And I take more photographs now on my mobile <coughs> phone than I've ever photographed on, um, on a camera. So um, please don't think that you're going to have to go out and spend tons and tons of money on uh, photographic equipment to achieve what we're talking about here, because you don't. Um, and this is another thing. <coughs> um, just remember that a picture is not a picture until it's actually printed, <laughs> in my opinion. So uh, I love to see, when, I, when I've done a photograph, I love to see the photograph in print. And um, for me, that's when it's actually come to its final, its final resting place. It's, it's, it's came to its uh, fruition uh, when that happens. Uh, can I ask a question to, to Christine here, just uh, so to uh, Leslie here, just for a second? Uh, could you unmute yourself, Leslie, just for a second? Is, is everything going okay? Because for some strange reason, I've not got anybody on my screen, so I can't see any reactions of anybody waving or, or people falling asleep or anything. Is it okay? 
Perfect. I, there, I've got no problems watching it from my end anyway, I can see, right. and I have got people on my screen, but maybe if, if you're not... Well, that's that's yeah. all I needed to know. <laughs> yeah. So that's fine. Thank you very much. I was slightly disconcerting because I thought, I'm probably sitting here talking away <laughs> and there's nobody there. <laughs> Don't worry, I've got the chat open now as well. So if anyone's putting any messages up on the chat, I will be able to see them. Yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer any questions that you want. So that's fine. So um that's that's the start of it. So let's 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 move on to the, the, the hints that I'm going to give you to improve your photography. And the number one rule uh, in photography, indeed, the number one rule in art is the rule of thirds, and it's the most simplest way to create some interest into your picture. Um, it's, it's simply a matter of dividing your frame that you're looking through into thirds and putting the subject matter, the thing of the main interest on one of the third lines or indeed on one of the third intersections. Yeah. Now, even modern cameras now, and indeed the, the phone, whatever, actually has these lines drawn onto them. You can actually bring them up on the screen. So you can use that as a guideline for the rule of thumbs. Because what you have to remember in photography, or sorry, what you have to remember in the human brain is the human brain actually likes to be challenged. So, you know, if you put a subject in the very center of a frame, right, and you say, here's my picture, right, your, your brain isn't going to be stimulated enough to even be interested in that picture. There has to be some visual interest in that picture to make the viewer indeed interested in it. And the rule of thirds, I've used it. In fact, if you look through my portfolio, through go to my website and have a look through the images, you'll see that the rule of thirds is used on a, a huge amount of the photographs, a huge amount of the photographs, because it simply works. In fact, I've done lectures at uh, Photographic College and I get students saying to me, you know, oh, the rule of thirds is boring, we try and avoid that. But, you know, and yes, you can create amazing photographs without the rule of thirds. However, it's there because it works and, and it's a really powerful thing. So what do you mean by the rule of thirds? Well, <clears throat> if we have a look at this image here, and everybody knows where that is, of course, it's the control tower up at through it that's taken just a few weeks ago in, in the snow. And um, I just think it's the most incredible building and I photographed it loads and loads of times. And there's a lovely thing about this particular picture and that's just that red part in it because red's a really powerful image. So we've got all this white here and just one pop of red, which really brings your eye in there and it's really interesting. But the rule of thumbs is simply that. So we're leaving it off to the left-hand side. In fact, I would like to have given it a little bit more room uh, to breathe, but I didn't have an opportunity in this instance to do that. But that's how simple the rule of thirds is. You're actually just offsetting it to one, one side or the other, and you're putting the main subject on a third line or on an intersection of a third line. And I'll tell you another thing about this picture. This picture is taken on my iPhone, and it's taken on a particular app in my iPhone, which is called um, Hipstamatic. And the Hipstamatic app is for me, it's, it's an absolute joy uh, and I use it all the time. I take literally thousands of photographs with my Hipstamatic app and you can use different film types and different looks and different filters and it looks absolutely amazing. And certain images it works better with. Um, this one here is called Florence Fade or Fade Florns, the film stock, and it gives this really beautiful, just little desaturated look to the image. And, and it looks brilliant with, with, with certain types of scenes. So that's the rule of thirds here. And here's another example. This is the other side, obviously, at the top of Tala, uh, looking back up again. And by using um, the rule of thirds again, if we see here, we can see that the, that's the, a very rough uh, grid line. And you can see that I've put the top horizon on the top third line. And, and that creates fantastic foreground interest. Now, if you think about it as well, as another little hint for your photography, is when you take a picture, think seriously about where you're going to place the horizon line. Because when you place a horizon line in a certain place, you are telling your viewer that the bit with more space, the bit with more picture on it, 
is actually the most interesting part of the picture. Now, in this image here, the sky was nice, but it wasn't that spectacular. So the most important part of this picture is the actual water itself. So therefore, I'm giving more emphasis to the water by using a high horizon line, which is on that third line there. I hope that makes some sense. Um, and this is another one. This is up at the Bothy. <coughs> um, and that's, that's a beautiful tree up there. And again, we've used the rule of thirds, quite simple. Um, bang on the third intersection there, that tree. Uh, and, and, and that is enough to get your, your, your brain stimulated to um, start to enjoy and explore the image. So the rule of thirds, very, very important. And this is another one. This is down at, um, it's um, Langham, isn't it? Where that mill is, where it's like going across the bridge on the way to Carlisle um, in Longtown. And um, I just have always, every time I come past this scene, I always absolutely love it. And it's particularly beautiful in, uh, in the autumn time. And um, with a sort of longer exposure that I've used on this picture, which has blurred the water a little bit, We've got a beautiful um, sort of pastoral scene. And again, let's just have a look at the thirds. Incre it's, it's such a powerful tool and such a simple tool for everybody to start to use in the photography. And, and I, I will guarantee you, it will improve your photography no end just by employing this, um, this simple rule um, into your image um, making. Uh, so I, I do a lot of um, street photography and street photography is one of my real passions. And so basically I, um, I don't know if somebody's noticed there, but Philip, oh yeah, somebody's let him in, I think. So Philip James is looking to get in in the waiting room. I got a notice there, I don't know if anybody saw that. Um, but I do a lot of street photography uh, and the street photography is very, um, it's uh, shooting from the hip. So it's a uh, quite surreptitious. So I'm kind of, photographing when people don't know I'm doing it. And it's like big game hunting without a gun. And um, so I'm, I'm basically, I basically stalk people, interesting people, strange people, um, and, um, and, 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 and take the images. But again, I'm always looking to try and use the rules if I can. And again, we've used the rules of thirds in this, this picture here. And um, uh, let me just tell you a little bit more about the street photography because I don't allow myself to crop these images after I've taken them. I only photograph them in black and white and I photograph them black and white on the camera. And I also uh, show everything because what I'm trying to do with these pictures is I'm trying to uh, put the viewer in my place. In other words, you are walking through that. So these arms at the right hand side, for instance, some people might have been tempted to take these guys out. But by doing that, what you do is you lose the cinematic feel to it. you. You lose the, the impact and you, that reality that the picture's got. So anyway, the rule of thirds. So that's the first thing. And, you know, I don't know if you're you know, going to write these down or if you're just going to embed them in your brain, but please do that because that rule of thirds, honestly, it will just, it will make your photography. The second one I want to talk about is when people see a picture, they just tend to pick a camera up and, and photograph it. Oh, there's an amazing church. Let's photograph it. Stop before you do that, for goodness sake. Just stop. Just stop. Look around. Think to yourself, if I move just a little bit to the right, I can miss out this. If I move a little bit closer, I can use this stone as a piece of foreground. If I, you know, just think before you shoot. So see the scene. Move to where you think, you know, the best place is going to be. Put it to your eye or put it through the camera on, on the screen in the back and just stop and think, can I improve it? Can I use something, for instance, to lead into the picture? Is there a fence at the right hand side? Can I, can I come to the right and use that fence to lead myself into that church? And this is exactly what I've done here. I've, I've went to this waterfall, which I can't use Racklin Falls or something down at Dumfries, I think. And again, I've used a long exposure. I'm going to talk about that at the end. That's something I'm going to talk about. But I've used a long exposure to give that beautiful movement in the water. But I've also used 
the rules of thirds in this as well. So I've moved to a position where I've got the rule of thirds. So the waterfall is on a third. In fact, it's on a third intersection. The top of the waterfall is on the top third line. And I've also got some bushes on the right-hand side and bushes on the left-hand side, which are holding the picture in. So your entire eye gets brought towards, in fact, I should be able to do this. Your eye gets brought right in here. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get your eye to come right into here. Yeah? So that's stop, think, before you press the button. Just improve your picture. You'll improve every time you do that. It's a slow process, this photography. Here's a perfect example. Again, this is only taken a couple of weeks ago. It's taken on the iPhone again. And it's two different scenes of exactly the same place. Now, both are nice pictures, but you can decide which, which is the best. The one on the right, of course, which has got the River Tweed sign on it, gives you some point. It gives you some relevance to the actual image. The other one is just a picture of a river as far as most people are concerned. So what I'm saying is with just a slight movement of the picture, you can create the picture that you really want as opposed to just taking the picture and, and getting what you get. Just think about it before you take the picture. It's a really, really important thing. And here's, a, here's another example. So this is from my back garden. And as you can see here, it's a nice rainbow. Yeah. And as you can see, this one here has got this thing here. It's got the kids climbing frame here. It's got a hot bit of light here and these pots. And it's just a little bit kind of anemic. This one here on the right hand side, however, by moving uh, the camera upright and using the bush at the beginning at the front here, the flowers at the front, as, as a base for the image, it's created a much more interesting picture. And in fact, if I go back into that there, you'll see I've now actually put right, that house there, which is it's in the middle, but it's actually on a third, uh, third line at the left. So you can see here, this is now on the third line, which is more interesting. So stop, think, stop again, think again, and then shoot, and you'll improve your photography no end. This is the church, obviously, down there. And again, this is what I mentioned. Is there something else you can do to that picture to make it more interesting? Well, the one thing about that is... Uh, the black and white, the impact of the black and white with that church is absolutely fantastic. But it's also on a third line. So we've actually got the, we've actually got the nice thirds here. And the church is sitting nicely right on the third line here, third intersection. And that makes all the difference to the picture. It's a little black and white treatment and um, a square crop. And it's a much more interesting picture, and much more balanced picture than the one on the left hand side. So the rule of thirds, absolutely the first thing you should be thinking about because that will improve your photography no end. And then stop, think, don't press the button, have a look again, refocus, reposition yourself, and then take the picture. So that's two done. The third one is don't be scared of the weather. Because the weather, bad weather in particular, makes much better pictures than nice sunny days. So most photographers hate going out in nice sunny days. Uh, the picture opportunities are way, way less than they would be in a more dramatic type of situation. And I love going out where um, it's been raining, you know it's just going to clear up, you get off to some spot, and there's a crack in this, the, the crack in the sky, and the sun comes out. The, the greens are much greener than they would normally be because of all the rain. And you just, and you get amazing clouds, and you just get better photography um, than you do when you're in nice weather. It's as simple as that. Um, so um, I, I love going out. I love going out in bad weather. So this this one here, this is um, down near in Arlington, near How Ford. And this is very, very early morning. And you can see the drama in the image, the drama in the clouds. And you know when I talked about horizons and I said that your 
as a photographer, you make a decision. And that decision is where am I going to place the horizon on this image? Because by doing that, of course, you're explaining to your customer, uh, sorry, your customer, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking money there, uh, your um, viewer, that um, the most important part of that picture is the biggest part that's, that's been seen. And in this image, unlike the previous one, in this image, it's the sky. The sky is so incredible and dramatic with that moon up there and, and the low, low, low horizon just being silhouetted. It's got such impact, this picture. And um, that's a really low horizon. That's even lower than a third line. <laughs> um, but I think, it's, uh, I think it's quite important it's that low because if you think about it, all it would be on frame would be black. It would just be black. I mean, it's silhouetted. So um yeah early morning in fact i would guess any time after sort of nine o'clock depends what time of year uh, is you're kind of losing it you want to get out there at dawn and you want to get out there at dusk that's when the most beautiful light is that's when the most interesting pictures that's when the most interesting clouds are uh, very seldom do you get great images at other times so early morning and dusk is the best by by far so um so this is Tweedsmere Mist. Uh, this was, uh, was an interesting story, actually, but we had people around at the house and um, we were all quite drunk. And about half past 11 at night in the middle of summer, uh, somebody said, look at this, look at the mist. So I ran upstairs onto my balcony up in the bedroom and I got my, my, my camera out um, and I used obviously my, my best, uh, my Hasselblad camera. And I took these pictures, uh, but at one point I was getting bitten to pieces by midges. And at one point I took my lens off and then I put another lens back on again to, to try a different view. <laughs> and then in the morning when I had sobered up, I went to develop the images and <clears throat> get them onto the computer. And the first lot of images were perfect. They were really clean. And the second lot, you couldn't even see the scene. I, I didn't realize it, but as soon as I took the lens off, uh, 15 million midges uh, came into my camera and covered my sensor, and it took me about a day to clean my sensor. So, <laughs> so that's another wee hint for you to improve your photography. Don't take photographs when you're drunk, <laughs> even though this one turned out pretty good. Um, so that's Tweedsmere Mist. Uh, and again, I've used a particular crop on this image. I've used the panoramic crop because the panoramic crop really lended itself to this lot, you know, the, the scene itself. And um, it's a beautiful ethereal uh, picture. Um, and again, bad weather. You don't often see Tala completely encased in mist. And I just thought it was really lovely. And um, I took one from the other end and then I went up the hill and took one from, from this end. And what's interesting about this is, is we're using foreground detail to kind of step us through the picture. So if I if I take my little pointer here, you know, we're starting here and we're coming into here and we're coming into here and we're, it, it kind of leads you through the picture. And there's one other thing I would like to mention about this picture. Now, I, I haven't mentioned this as one of the main points, one of the main 10 things, um, but um, triangles are phenomenally important in images. And sometimes the triangles are mistakes, and sometimes you see the triangles and you incorporate them in the scene. So if I if I go to this one, for instance, we've got a triangle here. Yeah, we've got a wee triangle. Oh, sorry, I've just switched that off. We've got a wee triangle there. We've got a triangle there. That's pretty much a triangle there. We, we, we basically, we've basically got triangles all over the place. And, and that's what makes the image because it's kind of built up and all these blocks using triangles. So um, it's quite a powerful, uh, quite a powerful tool to use as well. So you combine the rule of thirds, which this has got. If you combine stop, think, move around till you get to the perfect point where I've got some foreground detail, you combine that with the right day, for instance, bad weather, and then you combine that with triangles, and that's then what makes a picture great. Um, it's a combination of lots and lots of different things. Um, I don't know why I put that one in bad weather. I just really like the shots. I love all the lines, you know, the, the fields and all the rest of it. And I quite like the sky. It's just a simple little photograph. 
but not really bad weather. And this is the picture on the left hand side where um, I photographed just from above Tala there, the last one. And um, again, it's, it's stopping, it's thinking, where am I going to position it? Where's the boat going to go? Where's the horizon going to go? And the same thing from the top of Tala on the right hand side there with the, um, with, with the snow. And we've got our, you know, our, our step in. We've then got the river re leading us down to the, the lock. We've got, again, we've got a, 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 a rule of thirds um, line here. This is the third, if we take the third lines here. Yeah. So you can see that, you know, this is your, your point of intersection here and the horizons on the, the horizons on the main line. Here. So, um, yeah, bad weather. Bad weather is great. Um, this is just as just as the light is dying. Do you see the the, the muted colours in this? And, and it's got like a beautiful tone all the way through it. Well, that's what the picture looked like. And that this is in at Sligo, Rossi's Point in Sligo on the West Coast Island in the Wild Atlantic Way. And it's just beautiful, um, beautiful tones. It's got such a softness, a loveliness about it. Um, so yeah, don't, 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 don't go, you know, it's, it's five o'clock, I need to go for my tea, that's when you got to go out, because that's where the light's right, and that's where most photographers go wrong, is they take the photographs in the, in the, the wrong light. Good landscape photographers, by the way, they will sit and wait for an hour, they will sit and wait for two hours for that crack in the light, they'll, they'll wait until it happens, um, whereas we tend to go and just kind of take a, take a, a snap off it, you know, um, and that's why that's why they're better than us, because that's what they do, and they're really good at it. Um, the, the photograph on the left, by the way, just as a point of interest, the photograph on the left is obviously the, the devil's beef tub. And I was driving to, I was going to Glasgow to work, and I was just driving around, and I saw this crack in the, crack in the sky, this amazing clouds, and all of a sudden a shaft of light just came down and lit up the thing. And there was, even though it was running late, there was no way I was going to miss this. Unfortunately, I didn't have my big camera, I only had my iPhone. So this is photographing an iPhone. And do you know what? At the end of the day, how big am I going to, oh, well, that picture, I might have actually printed it really big, but on the whole, you guys are going to be printing 10 inches, 16 inches maximum. And you'll get that from an iPhone, absolutely no problem whatsoever. So don't think you can't print from an iPhone because the quality is unbelievable. I've got nice prints made up from iPhone stuff. And it wasn't even one of the modern iPhones. It was a 7 Plus, I think, I printed these off. Perfectly fine. So please don't, don't think you're going to need all this fancy equipment to do this because that picture there was shot on an iPhone on the left-hand side there. The picture on the right there, absolutely pouring rain. I was on holiday and we saw this. Um, the rain came. and We could see the rain coming from a mile. It was in Thailand, I think. We could see the rain coming. And when it arrived, this woman rushed out and she grabbed all the stuff off the table. She was one of the staff. And I just love the shape of it. I love the shape of her dress and the movement, her smile. And there's amazing triangles in there. And there's a rule of thirds in there. And there's amazing contrast between the orange, the blue, and the green, which are fantastic colors to combine together for impact. So the whole picture, even, and it's actually slightly out of focus. And you know what? I don't really care because the story of the picture and the power of the picture overcomes little things like that. I'm not really that incredibly fussy about um, images being slightly out of focus, as long as they speak to me, as long as they've got some soul and as long as they've got some impact. So that's that there. So we've done bad weather, we've done the rule of thirds, and we've done stop, think, and stop again and think and then take me out. Now what I'm talking about here is on number four, I'm talking about cropping an image. And cropping an image can make a big, big impact um, to how the image is seen. Now this picture here, for instance, this is a, this is a street portrait that I photograph. So I go around streets, cities, and I stop strangers and ask them if I can take their photograph. So this guy was in Princess Street Gardens in Edinburgh. Turned out he, his name was Willie and he was a, a soldier who was now on the streets, living on the streets. And I asked him if I could take his picture. And we did it in one of the, the shelters in Princess Street Gardens. 
And I've cropped it like this for, for a reason. Uh, most people would have left the, the background, the graffiti, the painting in the picture. But by doing that, your eye would be led all the way around the picture and not to the place that I wanted you to be going to, which is his face. I want the impact in that picture to be bang on his eyes. And his eyes are being placed very, very carefully on, guess, guess what, on a third line. So if I take, if I take that line there, that's a third. Yeah, so he's, they're on a third line. And the other thing that this picture has is the triangle. And um, which is, again, I've mentioned before, it's an incredibly powerful tool. So when you build your pictures up through triangles, it works really well. So this here helps me direct the viewer's, the viewer's um, attention directly to the place I want it to go, which is to his face. Um, I, I really love this picture. And the reason that I cropped it like this off right tight to the right hand side is number one, I, I actually shot it like this. That's the first thing. But the second thing is I wanted to show it was a public place. Now this is Oxford and this couple dress, they're there every day. They dress identically. They've got the cigarettes in the same hand. They've got the same coats, they've got the same bow ties, the same jumpers. They are real eccentrics, and they're just the sort of people you want to see round about Oxford. They're extraordinary. And the reason I left that bench on the left-hand side is I wanted to be very, very aware to my viewer that it was actually a public place that they were in. And I think if I had cropped it, it was just there in the middle as a portrait, it wouldn't have had the same impact. So <clears throat> again, this is a kind of form of street photography that, that I do. But I just think they're the most incredible couple. I'd love to go back and photograph them properly, actually, uh, rather than surreptitiously. But anyway, um, again, um, this is taken in Las Vegas. I was doing some street photography, and I noticed that there was this building where uh, the sun was, it's hard to explain, but I just noticed the graphic shapes and the couple standing there. So I kind of moved myself around until I made sure that the couple were, were clear in the image, not blending into that right-hand side. And I exposed my image for the actual light part of the image, which has made everything else go very, very dark and silhouetted. And um, it's just quite a powerful graphic picture. Again, it's kind of built up using uh, angles and triangles and diagonals and all sorts of stuff, which gives it some real impact. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about exposing for the highlights in one of the other parts of this, because that's a really, really important thing. Um, and we'll go over that. Again, incredible crop. I mean, this is in Sligo as well, I think, somewhere in the west coast of Ireland. And I noticed I was walking with this girl um, who's one of my, my studios that I work with. And I saw this uh, <clears throat> mural on, on the wall and I said, oh, look at this. And she says, I've never seen that before. And she lives there. So it just shows you how, I don't know how you could miss that. And so anyway, I took a picture, but it's a very unusual crop. So I, basically she's almost hidden in the picture it becomes almost like a, a where's wally you know but it's it's lovely so it's almost monochromatic just apart from the color of her face and skin and it's a very very powerful picture again very graphic very kind of painterly looking um, and again just cropping for impact if you look at the right hand picture for instance the one with the snow i love the contrast between the garage door and the snow and i love the black window above it and then that amazing roof where you've got the two triangles at the side and then a main triangle. And it's just pure graphics. So really, really interesting. So, you know, and I've cropped into that to make that work, uh, that picture, the symmetry and the contrast between the blacks and the whites, I think is really powerful. And then the picture to the left-hand side, again, I've positioned myself very carefully. This is Renshaw Gardens in Derbyshire. I position myself very carefully to have that um, main interest, which is the light on the seat, on my, on my third line. So I keep coming back to it. You'll hear this all the time. The third line, the third line, the third line. And here we go. Let's just talk about the horizons once again. So in the top picture, you know now because I've explained that I'm telling you as my viewer 
that the most important part of this picture is the sky. And these little silhouetted trees in the bottom are just holding the picture in and give it some interest. The picture on the bottom, however, which is a, a, a lake somewhere, a lock somewhere near Hoyk, I can't even remember the name of it. What I've done is I've used a central composition. Oh, excuse me. Is I've used this line here is absolutely bang in the middle. And when you're doing stuff like um, reflections in, in a lake or whatever, um, a central horizon line is really important because what I'm now telling you as my viewer is I'm telling you that the top half is equally as important as the bottom half. In other words, both parts are equally important. And so it, it also gives a sense of tranquility when you use a central horizon line and it gives a sense of peace and quietness. Whereas the top picture has got a lot more tension in it with that line being so far down the um, down, down, down the frame. So that's us got another one done. That's number four. That's number five. So this one here, um, you know, photography actually, you know, means drawing with light. That's literally what it means. And light is the most important thing in photography. And understanding light, whether you be taking a, a simple portrait um, or you're outside doing some work, um, understanding directional light and how it's going to impact on the picture is a really, really important thing. Now, I do an entire day seminar on just finding the light <laughs> and it's quite intense and all the rest of it <clears throat> and it goes into huge detail. Um, but, excuse me, for me, when I'm doing, for me, when I'm doing my portraiture, the first thing is, the first important thing to me is the light, and then I'll work everything out afterwards, because I don't really care about the background, because I can knock the background out of focus in the camera. So I'm more interested in the, in the quality and the shape of, of the light. And what, what, what do you mean by that? Well, it's fairly obvious if you have a look at this picture here. The picture on the left, by the way, I, I stole off the internet. I, I don't know whose it is but it's terrible, terrible light. Now this was on a professional photographer's site and it's utterly appalling. So the light is coming basically from round the child's face. It's, 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 it's casting the face into shadow. Whereas the photograph on the right hand side, which was one I photographed, the light is in the absolute perfect place. We're, we're lighting the face, we're illuminating the face. Now, if you think about it, you know, when you do a Zoom call or when you see a Zoom call, the amount of people who put the light, the window behind them and then let their face go into shadow is unbelievable because all you need to do is turn your thing around and have your light right at your face and you'd create a beautiful light for your Zoom call. <laughs> it's a fairly simple concept. And the same thing applies to, um, to the photography. This Zoom thing drives me mad, by the way. You know when you watch politicians on Newsnight or something and they're getting a Zoom call? And, and they're like silhouetted and there's like a color cast and there's, goodness, I mean, it's no hard. Just the light needs to be at the front. <laughs> That's the key thing. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for beautiful, beautiful quality window light here, right? I'm not talking about studio flash. I'm not talking about big umbrellas and soft boxes and all that professional stuff. What I'm talking about is using beautiful daylight to take a portrait. Now, the pho photograph on the left-hand side there, which is Tom Weir, the author and, 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 and walker, I'll tell you a story about him, actually. Um, I was photographing him at his house at Loch Lomond, and I was late in Glasgow, but stuck in traffic, and I couldn't, his address I got was Tom Weir, Loch Lomond, right? So it was, it's a big place. So I had to do some detective work to actually find out where he stayed, and I arrived about, I don't know, maybe half an hour late. And I knocked at the door, and this wee woman came to the door, and she was she was more brune. That's all. I'm just going to say she was more brune. Right? She had she, she had the the apron on and the 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 colours, and she just like was more brune. And she goes, um, "Can I help you, son?" And I says, "Yes." I said, I, I, I'm, "I'm here to photograph Mr. Weir." Oh, she says, "Well, come on in, and I'll tell you about that." I thought, oh, "God, what's going on here?" 
So I came in and she said, uh, now Tom said that he's away for a walk and he'll be back soon. And because you were late, that'll just serve you, right? I thought, well, there you go. <laughs> so, and she says to me, um, watch out for him because he's a bit of a, you know, he might shout at you and that. So when he arrived back, he, he was a gem, honestly. It was lovely to photograph. Um, and he's the only man ever that when I sent the contact sheets, he sent me back a written critique on each of the pictures in the contact sheet and he had China graphed them all and all. <laughs> it's quite a character. But how I photographed him here, and I wanted to retain, you know, all his wrinkles and his, his beautiful, fantastic nose and all that kind of stuff, his moustache and the textures in the image and his jumper and everything. So I've used the light slightly round to the side. So I've positioned them so that the window light is coming into his face, but from the side. And you can see the catch light in the eye. It's at the left-hand side. And so you can see exactly where the light's coming from, right? And that way, I'm still retaining. I'm, I'm getting what you call a little loop shadow. It's, it's called loop lighting. And if I put my wee thing here, you can see that there's a loop just at the nose there, right? And you can see that the catch lights are up at uh, 10 o'clock, we would call that. And that's exactly where I want them to be for loop lighting. The picture of Kirsty Wark, on the other hand, which is photographed in the tenement, um, uh, tenement um, hallway, all I've done is I've opened up the front door and I've let the light flood in from right behind me. So you've got what's really, really flat lighting, right? So if I, I don't know if I can, no, I can't, sorry. Um, you can see that there's like a butterfly shape underneath her nose, and that's because the light is coming directly from the front. So we've got side light, loop light on the left-hand side, and we've got frontal light on the right-hand side. So when you're photographing your, um, your kids next, or when you're photographing a person next, whoever it might be, yeah, loop light, frontal light, and you can see exactly in this picture where the position is. So on the left-hand side, we've got our window at the left-hand side, and Tom is at the back of that window, so the light is coming in from the side. The picture of Kirsty Work on the right-hand side, the, the, it's actually it says window, but it was actually a door, and the light is coming directly from behind me. So I'm actually standing right in front of the light, therefore you're getting proper frontal light. And, and so you can shape your images by just moving people backwards and forwards across the window, bringing them to the front of the window to create beauty light, bringing them to the side of the window to create split light, and you can create all sorts of beautiful lighting patterns. So that's us back there. The left-hand side, the loop light, light from the side. Just think about it when you're photographing people and the, uh, and the frontal light on the right-hand side. <coughs> this is, <coughs> this is um, Ricky Fulton. And I've positioned him very carefully and I've put an old picture of himself when he was 21 or something up on the left-hand side on the, on the thing. But a couple of things to look at in this picture. This is uh, also loop lighting. Uh, the light's coming from the side. I've got a beautiful loop at the side of his nose. Um, it's almost Rembrandt light, actually, but it's, it's pretty loopy there. And I've actually got um, the rule of thirds again. So if you think about it, and we've actually break this up. My God, I keep going into this rule of thirds, but it's perfectly true. So, oops, that is it. So we've got our here, we've got our thirds. All right? Look at that. Yeah? So the rule of thirds, phenomenally important. And, and side lip, once again. And this is what you would call split lip. So there's actually only light on one side of the face and the other side is much, much darker in shadow. And that's a fantastic light for photographing a man. It's a very impactful light. So I would use side light and split light for men. And I would use frontal light, beauty light for women because they like that better. You don't show up any wrinkles or anything. So this again, this is frontal light. So this is light coming directly from behind me, creating a beautiful open lighting pattern on the face, all daylight, very, very simple indeed. And this is a frontal light uh, photograph from above, but this is, a, I was doing a seminar in, in Lanzarote and you can see that my <coughs> human lighting assistant there is holding the light right in front of her nose and you can see that loop shadow at the nose. And it's all about just moving the light around just to get that pattern that you like on the face. It's a really simple thing lighting. But once you understand where to position the person at a window or a door or in a doorway or whatever, you, you will, again, your lighting will improve dramatically. 
So that's 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 a bit late. It's very very simple, a bit late. As I say, normally that's eight hours to talk about that. So um, <laughs> with demonstrations, <clears throat> but that's very simple. So I want to talk about kids because everybody says, "How do you photograph your kids?" And it's really really simple. You get down to their level. Most people, when they photograph children, they stand up and you've got these little people and they're looking down on them. And you don't want that. You want to be lying down. You want to be getting down to their level. And it'll be a much more powerful picture for it. So this wee, wee girl here, uh, uh, of course, I'm actually lying on the ground, shooting through the daisies to give that beautiful foreground detail. Lovely light on the face, a little bit of light coming through, hitting her hair, <clears throat> and great colours in the background. As I say, I've, the light's the most important thing for me first, and I can knock that background out of focus. It, it wouldn't matter if there was a bin there, or probably if somebody was walking past, it would be knocked out of focus. So <clears throat> that's very, very important. So get down to their level. That's a key thing when you're photographing, when you're photographing children. Again, get down to the level. Look at the rule of thirds. Uh, studio portrait. Uh, this is me replicating inside using my lighting exactly what I was telling you earlier on with the, um, the Tom Weir picture. Uh, 10 o'clock, uh, catch light in the eyes, a little loop shadow at the side of the face. Very simple. But bang on his eye level. Not above it. That's a big no-no. So always get down to their level. Yeah, just a little fantasy tea party thing. Okay, so that, that's a simple one with, with children. It's 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 um get them involved. Get 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 them playing. <clears throat> that's a key thing. Get them playing. Use things in the foreground that are relevant to it. Shoot through flowers. Um Shoot through, get, get, get at angles, go, go low. It's, it's really cool. Um, get dry. Number eight, this is one of my favorite things to do. So I do what, what I call multi-image montages and they're, they're usually just blocks of four or blocks of nine. And everywhere I go with my iPhone, I photograph details. For me, I will get more information about a place through little details like signs and doors and locks and all that kind of stuff than I ever will from <clears throat> a, a photograph of a church. So I love creating montages. Uh, the piece of software that I, that I use is called uh, Diptych. I, I don't know if we can, I don't know if you can see that. It, 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 it's basically a, a simple way, D-I-P-T-I-C, Diptych. And it's a really simple way of building up montages. And I think it's a couple of pounds on, on the iStore or the, the Apple App Store. Um, and I think you can get it for Android as well. And, and it's just a really easy way by photographing. Uh, I use the Hipstamatic, of course. This is my Florence Spade again. This is uh, Haddingham and Tame down in Oxfordshire. And I, what I love about it is, is I photograph them on the phone and I have the uh, montage done as I'm walking along the road, it's finished, it's done. I could then send it off for print, it's fantastic. In fact, I was in Venice two years ago and I created two photo books on the way home in the plane and had the books ordered by the time I got off the plane. Um, it, it was fantastic. So no work on Photoshop, not downloaded onto my computer, everything happened, happened on the phone. That's exciting to me. I think that's the most incredible, incredible thing. Um, it's an instantaneous thing about shooting, shooting on a phone. So anyway, that's one of my multi-nine blocks. This is a block that I did for Rick Steen <coughs> at the Seafood School down in Padstow. And it was just, I've been there three or four times, and it was just to um, give my impression of the, the cook school. And, and I printed it up big and I presented it to him the next time I went. Um, which was lovely, and he's got, he's got that up in the cook school, actually. But for me, it tells you more about it than just a, a single image. Um, this, is, um, this is tourists in the Cotswolds. And again, just, lots of Japanese. Apparently, um, there's this village in the Cotswolds, I can't even remember what it's called, somebody will probably tell me at the end of this, 
There's this village in the Cotswold and the Japanese emperor went there once and the place is absolutely inundated with Japanese tourists. Thousands of them, busloads, busloads of them. And it's a fantastic place to photograph uh, street photography. Um, this is Kilkenny. You're getting the idea with these multi-blocks. They're, they're really exciting uh, ways to display your images. Uh, this is Venice. This is the palace in Venice. And again, it's all just details, but it's beautiful. And this is another um, film stock that I use called the uh, Yucatel, Yucatel 20. And um, it's a kind of degraded sepia look to it. And this is a little village in Mayo, um, an island called Clare Morris. And it's extraordinary. It's, it's like the land that time forgot. Every second house and business is pretty much a wrecked building. And I, I must have about 50 more of these of all the buildings in Clare Morris. And I just really love the feel of it. It's kind of industrial, you know, destruction, you know, um, and it really suits the colors and everything. And again, this is Derby. And, and the reason I used this particular film stock and put this montage together like this was um, it really suits the red brick of Derby. Derby is kind of built on red brick. And I really love the tones in the image with, um, with a particular film stock. This is Florence Fade on the Hipstomatic app on the iPhone. So that's, that's my little montage blocks. And <clears throat> again, what I love about it is I can, I can photograph that, I can make the, the, the multiple and I can upload it to Facebook or Instagram immediately and um, no got to wait to get it on the computer. And it's this instant thing I absolutely love. Now, this is a, a number nine we're getting on. Time-wise, it's perfect. Number, number nine um, is about exposing for the highlights in your image. And this is something I was taught way, way back, way, way back early in my career by a photographer. And he said to me, <clears throat> he said, look, if you expose for the highlights, and what he means by that is this don't go straight for the sun, but somewhere near the sun, you're going to get much more powerful pictures. You're going to get pictures which have got more saturation. You're going to get pictures that have got more power. You're going to get pictures that have got more detail in the highlights less detail in the shadows, of course, but your photography will inevitably improve. Now, I use the same rule from a portraiture. So when I'm photographing a portrait, this here, this light is my main light. I would be exposing for this here, and I'd be letting the rest of the scene work out itself. Now, I obviously use, I obviously use a, proper, a proper light meter, um, but there's meters in the camera, of course, but there's also meters on your iPhone. So when you take your camera and you're looking at the camera, um, at your picture, all you do is just take your finger and touch a light part of the picture and you'll immediately see your picture going darker. And you'll get much more saturated images, much more beautiful images, much more impactful images, particularly when it comes to things like um, sunsets and sunrises and, and all the rest of it, and you're looking to create silhouettes. So this photograph here is photographed in somewhere in South Africa along, um, <clears throat> I can't remember where that is, along the wine route somewhere. And I just noticed this cross up in the, I noticed this cross up in the hill and it was getting dark. And again, I've exposed for, um, I've exposed for this part of the picture right here, I'll show you. I've exposed for here. Now there is still detail in that white part of the picture here, but the rest of the image has just got really dramatic. And again, let's just talk about the rule of thirds. Yeah. Top line, on a top third line, very, very important. So that's exposing for the highlights. This is, um, this is Land's End, this is Cabo San Lucas and the Baja Peninsula uh, in, in uh, Mexico. Again, rule of thirds, exposing for the highlights, absolute drama. We've got the, uh, we've got the, the light of the sun on the water. <clears throat> we've got that diffraction of the sun with my, that's through my lens. Uh, it's just a, you know, very, very powerful and deep and dark. Uh, this is Botswana, that's a sea eagle. Uh, and this is, um, again, this is an interesting thing because um, that sea eagle's tiny, 
And that tree's not that big, but that's the first place you go in the picture because um, that's the biggest point of contrast in the picture with that light area behind and then the silhouette of the, the sea eagle um, on the thing. And I've also uh, cropped it with a central horizon line. You remember we've talked about horizon lines before. Well, that central horizon line is very, very, very important. Uh, Colton Hill in Edinburgh, rule of thirds, look where the position is. Exposed for the highlights, real drama. Uh, again, People's Church, uh, snowy sun, uh, sunrise. Again, exposed for the highlights, we've got um, quite dramatic image. And, and look at that portrait here. This, this is Elvis. It probably isn't the real Elvis, but it's Elvis anyway. And it's bright sunlight. And most photographers, I think, would get rather phased by this. But I've exposed this image uh, exactly for here. So for this bright part, you can see there's still detail in here. There's detail all over here, right? And then we've got nice dark in here and everything else in the scenes went nice and dark. But that's where that's exposed for, right in that sun there. Let the rest of the picture deal with itself. So on the iPhone, I would simply have touched that part on my iPhone screen and that would have exposed for that part of the image. So again, you don't need any fancy equipment. You don't need all these meters and all the meters in the camera and all the rest. You can do it perfectly adequately with your mobile device. And number 10, um, abstracts. Uh, getting in close. Uh, so I, I love doing it. I love just walking around and, you know, a macro lens on the camera or just a, a zoom lens <clears throat> and, and getting in really close. And I love photographing flowers. Um, so it's lovely when you get just that one bloom in focus and let the rest of it just drift away into the background. Very powerful. And, you know, there's photography, there's photographs everywhere. And I did a whole collection, a whole series. In fact, I think it might be featured this month in Camera Craft magazine because I sent, I sent it in for a portfolio section. Um, but they were all just close-ups of leaves and they were all beautiful, narrowed leaves. They weren't like beautiful leaves. I wasn't looking for that. I was looking for leaves that were really interesting. And for me, when I photographed that and, and, and I took all the edges away and I just focused very, very closely on the leaf, I, I think it looks like... A, a photograph, um, an aerial photograph of like the Brazilian forest or something. It's just an amazing, just graphic, beautiful image. And when you see it, when you see it big, the colours in there are incredible. <clears throat> Golds and all sorts of stuff in the lines. It's really beautiful. So that's a great thing. It's, it's getting in close, um, makes a great picture. Um, again, um, this, I don't know how this got in getting in close. It wasn't supposed to. You see, that for amongst me there because that's not supposed to be in there. That's, <laughs> that's another one of my um, collection ones. Uh, but yeah, just details. So this was at the harbour up Northern Ireland, somewhere up the north coast. And uh, I, just, uh, I just saw the rings and the rust and <clears throat> getting close. Uh, it's just, it's, I, love, I love this type of picture. There's another one. That's obviously just a rusty ladder heading down to the stuff. There's photography everywhere you look. There's no excuse, and this this type of photography, these these graphic type images, these can be photographed in any sort of weather. You don't need, you know, have to be up early to photograph a fabulous landscape or sunset or the golden hour or all that stuff. These kind of photographs actually work best in like um, dull light, dull overcast grey surroundings. Um, so that's that's um, getting in closer. That was one I took at the forest up at, up, uh, opposite me in um, farm uh, and just moved the camera as I, as I photographed it. So I've basically just taken the camera and as I photographed it, I've just, well, like that. So I've just moved the camera when I pressed the button and we've got this um, impress, impressionistic um, look to the picture. Again, as I say, that this type of image is just everywhere. Details of the trees, details of doors, just getting close. You can sail down at Cork. And there's a bonus, look at that. I don't say I'm no good to you. So the bonus is long exposure. And to be honest, to do long exposure, you can do it and you know, there is long exposure settings on your camera um, and there's apps that you can get for your iPhone. So you a little tripod 
and put your thing on the little tripods and set it to long exposure and you can get this type of thing. But I must admit, it's a lot easier when you're doing it on a proper camera at this stage. And the one thing that you do need is to do it properly is one of these. I don't know if you can see that, but that is a neutral density filter and that stops light coming in through the lens and hitting the sensor. So what it does is it increases the amount of light that need, is needed to, to make an exposure, okay, on, 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 your, on your sensor. Therefore, you're going to need a longer shutter speed to create an image. Now, this one is what's called a 10 times stopper. So this stops 10 times the amount of light coming in. So therefore, a photograph that would normally be an exposure of 60th of a second might be an exposure of five minutes or six minutes to, to get the image. And therefore, what you do is you get that amazing blurry effect in cloud movement and blurry effect in water movement. And that's how professional landscape photographers come up with this type of shot. So you can see here, this is, um, God, what's the name of the castle? I forgot the name of the castle down the East Coast. Um, Saved the caravan part of it as well. Anyway, um, you can see that the, the, the sea is totally smoothed out and the sky has got that incredible burst look, incredible soft look to it. And that's been done with a 10 times softer. Look at the rule of thumbs, by the way. That <laughs> castle's bang on the rule of thumbs. Um, <clears throat> two other shots. One, of course, is the bridge just down the road there. And the other one is the Grey Mare's Tail. And again, photographed on the long exposure, just gives that beautiful movement of water. This is a really great technique for anybody that's looking to um, just improve their landscapes a little bit more. A little bit more advanced, perhaps, than some of the other stuff that I've been talking about, but it's it's one surefire way to make really impactful images. It's one of my favourites. This is a really long exposure of the sea just at uh, East Lothian, and um, I just love it. And I love the tones and the, the, the movement in the, in the clouds and, and the, the water hitting the, the rocks there. Um, uh, simple, simple little um, little picture, and and that's me, and um, that's eleven ways to improve your photography. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you want to bring anybody in, um, Leslie or Francis, whoever's doing that. Yeah. Hi, hi, Kenny. Thank you very much. I'm just going to go straight to um, the chat because Colin Shearer has. I'm, I'm sorry, Colin. I didn't put, pull you in when you put your question up because I did think. Kenny was in the middle of a chat, so I just waited, if you don't, till, till now. Yeah, So um, I, I couldn't you, see you anyway. I know, so um, Colin was wondering if um, the castle you were talking about was Fast Castle or Tantalan? Uh, Tantalan, it's Tantalan Tantalan Castle. Castle. And he has a question, he was wondering if you ever use Flash, and if so, how and when? Yeah, yeah, I do, I do use Flash. Now, um, actually, I'm not a I'm not a huge fan of just on, on, on top on, on top on. camera. You know? No, it doesn't. It's, uh... I'm not I'm not a massive fan of flashing top of the camera. I do have one and, and I do use it occasionally, but I normally use it off the camera. I normally take it off the camera and use it remotely to create some shape to the to, to the picture. So I don't really I use studio flash obviously all the time. So no, I'm not a huge uh, lover of flash. I would, I would class myself as a, a natural light photographer. It's what I prefer to do. And I think when you see these pictures, like with Tom Weir and, and all the rest of it, you can see the beauty that you can actually get by using just window light. So when I go on a commercial job, when I'm, when I'm going on an editorial portrait job to photograph a, a, a chief executive or a, a, a musician or whatever it may be, I've got all my kit in the car. I, I've, got, I've got 10 lights. I've got you know spare cameras, I've got everything. And when I arrive at the location, I walk in and normally I just find the light. Normally I'll find a window or something interesting to photograph with. And I very seldom ever actually take the lights out of the car. So I'd say 90 plus percent of my photography is photographed at natural light, which I love. It's easier, it's quicker. My customers like it because they're no hanging around with me, faffing around with lights and meters. Even though I do, of course, use them all the time, that, you know, 
I teach it, but my preference is natural light. I think it's more beautiful. So thank you. I've got a question from Eric. Eric, do you want to ask a question? Want to unmute and ask rather than me? <clears throat> Yeah, no, thanks. I was just wondering how much time you spend, I guess, kind of using Photoshop after you take the image. So loads of photos you showed were, were amazing. I just wonder how much time you spend playing with them after you've actually taken them. Well, OK. Um, well, the, I, the, I, the iPhone pictures, I, take, I, I do none. So the iPhone pictures are straight from the, the camera. Um, I would say that I work on every picture that actually gets bought or every picture that is published or whatever has, has been worked on in Photoshop. There is no doubt about that. Uh, I, I want to make that picture as good as I can possibly make it. On saying that, I'm not one of these photographers that adds skies, you know, and removes all sorts of things and does loads of tricks with Photoshop. I like it because I want to bring the most amount of detail I can out of the picture. I want to maybe saturate colours just a little bit more. Um, and I want to crop, of course, as well, which is vitally important for me. So I'm not a massive Photoshop fan. I'm not really that great on Photoshop compared to some, some guys that I work with who are just incredible at it. But I can do what I need to do on it. And yes, the answer is I do work on most of the images on Photoshop, but it's not the most important thing. <clears throat> it's just to tweak them. So colour, saturation, contrast, and cropping, etc. That's great, thanks. No problem. Any other questions? I can look through if anyone wants to wave at me. Duncan, I think Duncan's waving. Hello, Duncan. Duncan, can you just unmute yourself, please? I still think you're on mute. That's the fav favourite phrase of um, Zoom calls. Well, rather than that, just moving on to that last yeah. question, Leslie, can I just ask Kenny if he would bracket for the camera rather than do it? So would you bracket your exposure now when you take photographs? No need. There's no need now. Um, in the past, in the past when you were photographing film, you had a... OK, let's get a wee bit technical. It's called dynamic range. And the dynamic range is the amount of information that that material, i.e. the film, can actually hold. In other words, there's going to be a point where the white's too white and there's going to be a point where the dark's too dark and you'll lose detail, right? Now, in the past, that was seven f-stops on your camera. So you had about you know, three and a half f-stops either side of a perfect exposure to record detail. This, this camera here now has got 14 and a half stops of dynamic range. I, I, you can bring back the most unexposed or overexposed picture in Photoshop now. And really, I can't remember the last time that I actually bracketed an image. What, what he means by that is you take one exposure and then you underexpose or underexpose, underexpose, overexpose, 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 so that you're definitely going to get your exposure correct. There's really no need to do that now. The, 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 the dynamic range within modern digital cameras will hold more than enough information. In fact, <clears throat> to the point where Landscape photographers used to, let's say, take an exposure for a waterfall, right? They're photographing a waterfall. And then they would put one, I talked about this neutral density filter. What they would do is they would actually put a graduated filter on the top of that to bring the sky down to the same level as the waterfall. There's no need now because the amount of information that the sensor is recording can bring that back. So actually it's a bit of a waste of time to be honest with you. Now, Purists, purist landscape photographers will be aghast at that. You know, they still do it. They, they, they want the pain. I didn't want the pain. I'm quite happy to do it the easy way. <laughs> Thank you. That's a pleasure. Can I yeah. ask? Can I ask about those lovely long exposure photographs? Do you yes. go out with a, a tripod for these? Yes. Yes, sorry, I should have mentioned that. The, the one absolutely key thing about these images is you do need your camera on some sort of tripod, yeah? Um, now, it doesn't have to be, look, look, that, I've got a tiny little tripod, see that oh, shit! <laughs> hang on, hang on, I'll be back. 
<laughs> I knew I shouldn't have touched that. Hang on, I'll be back. I'm coming. I'm coming. Um, Jesus, are we back? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, we're back. Oh, geez, that was close. You see that? That's a little. That's a little gorilla pod, right? And that's that's it's got a microphone on it just now. I don't know if it's still working. Um, but the the gorilla pod is used for my is used for my iPhone. So I carry that in my in my pocket or in my bag. And anytime I'm photographing on my iPhone, uh, I use I use that. And I can actually do long exposures on that. On saying that, however, um, steady now. <laughs> I don't even know where it is, but I mean, my big tripod is a big tripod. You know, it's a it's a proper, huge, thick tripod, and that's essential because the camera's got to be still. Uh, you know, so um, so yeah, that that's that's that that's a definite. And the way to do it is um, is this this holds back so much light. I mean, so much light that I usually photograph all my landscapes with the smallest aperture, which gives me the, the widest depth field. It gives me more in focus. But of course that lets less light into the camera. So sometimes when you do this, you have to actually photograph your landscapes, not quite at F22 or whatever. You have to actually little, because otherwise it would be a 30 minute hour exposure. So I'm looking for these type of pictures with the movement in the water. I'm looking for maybe two, three, four minutes to give some movement. So that definitely needs a tripod. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's another question from Colin. Colin, do you want yep. to unmute? Uh, yeah, we can hear you, Colin. Oh no, thanks. Colin. Uh, I'm sorry I can't get the video to work, but uh, anyway, it was just, uh, just interested, Kenny, if you have a preference for black and white or color photography, or it doesn't really matter to you. Well, you know, certain things look, I mean, all my street photography is black and white. So when I go out in the streets and I'm shooting from, from the hip and I'm doing that kind of Henri Cartier, Bresson, Arty kind of stuff, it's all black and white. In fact, it's shot in black and white and I, I wouldn't do it in colour. It's done. On saying that, you know, I think colour is really, really important and colour can add stuff to a picture. So colour, colour is an emotional thing. So for instance, as a professional, if somebody says to me, you know, I, I, I'm starting this company, uh, I'm doing, um, I'm doing digital, uh, it's digital, I'm doing diamond encrusted iPhones to sell to the stars, right? So they've got an amazing product, they take an iPhone, they strip it all, they make it solid gold, they put diamonds on it, and people do that by the way. So it's an incredibly valuable thing. So I'm going to photograph, and he wants me to photograph it, right? I'm going to use purple. I'm, I'm going to use purple, purple velvet, purple material, because purple is an incredibly rich color. It, you, you look at purple and you think money. It's a strange thing, but you kind of do. So there's loads of psychology that can be used in color. Like, so for instance, um, uh, water, bottled water, is almost always in blue and green bottles. There's a reason for that, you know, because it looks damn weird if it's in an orange bottle, because you're looking to try and impart to the viewer, to the person who's going to buy that bottle, the freshness and the cleanness of it. And we can use the same things in photography. So, you know, you're trying to create warmth in an image, you're obviously going to use yellows and oranges. You're trying to create wealth in an image, you're obviously going to use stuff like purples and things like that. So color's really, really important. Um, now, I, I know some wedding photographers that just photograph in black and white. And I, because they think it's kind of arty and, and a really good idea. I think it's stupid. I, I, I really do, because I think the most important, I know when my daughter got married many, many, many moons ago, I'm still paying for it actually. Um, that was years ago. Um, I remember when she got married, right? The most important thing was what color are the bridesmaids' dresses? What color are the flowers going to be in the church? What color is this? What color is that? It was all about color. Can you imagine then you've, you've done all this color stuff and then the guy comes along and does everything in black and white. So I'm actually, I actually like color photography. You saw my, uh, most of my stuff was color there, you know, but um, I do, I do love black and white because it's timeless. And I do love black and white because 
a black and white image can tell a can tell a story. For instance, a press story, it can tell it really importantly without distraction, right? So you, if you look at the great images, um, you know, the wee kid in Hiroshima running away, um, really important press pictures are always in black and white because um, you didn't want that message to be, to be confused by colour, if you understand what I mean. It's amazing how, how one single black and white picture can, can create great impact and tell a story uh, much better than, than a colour one. But no, I do like colour photography, particularly landscapes. I don't do many landscapes in, in black and white, I'm mostly in colour. Uh, it's, it's part of nature, you know. Uh, I've got another question, um, Kenny, from Eric again, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm 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 stunned, Eric. I'm Kirsty. Kenny, thank Hi, you Kirstie. so much. It was absolutely <laughs> fascinating. I the, the technological you know aspects of your photography are, are way beyond me. So I have a very simple question, which is, what's the favourite photo that you've ever taken, and and why? And then my sort of PS to that, if that's okay, Kenny, is I have omitted to write down the the app that you use that allows you to take those multi-image uh, <laughs> photographs. So I wonder if you could maybe repeat that, if that's okay, please. Thank you. It, yep, it's called Diptic, D-I-P-T-I-C, Diptic. Thank you very much. You'll see, you'll see there, you see there's all the different types of styles that you can, you can use. And, and you just basically click into one of them like, so I'm going to use that one, and then you add the images from your from your phone. It's, it works brilliantly. So brilliant. Anyway. Thank you. Uh, my favourite photograph ever. Um, oh god, that's really caught me on the spot. It's going to be a portrait. Um, uh, <laughs> oh god. I'll tell you actually one of my favourites, it was actually in the presentation, and it was a photograph of the woman, the out of focus woman, with her orange stuff on and all the rain, and you have to see that picture at a decent size to get the impact of it, but it's absolutely amazing. Um, the, the shape of her legs, the shape of the, the, the kind of calots that she's got on, she's covered her head in that orange tablecloth and it's like a triangle, you can just see the smile. And the rain is absolutely sideways. I mean, it was phenomenal. And I've always loved that picture. And, and, and it was taken on a, it was not on a, an iPhone, but it was taken on a little snappy camera, you know, just a little compact camera. Hence the reason it's sort of slightly out of focus. But it doesn't really matter because it's just really, it's really powerful. Um, I mean, I've got stuff. Um, I'll come back. Um, that is, that's a very precious picture to me. That, that is the cover, I did the cover art for Fish's uh, Wilderness the Mirrors album. And um, he came to the studio and we did the picture and then the guy did the artwork and he presented me with, a, with this one, which was signed by him and, and tested, uh, sorry, it, it was, it's all cut out. It's, it's not the finished piece. So this is the, the test artwork that, for the album, and he very kindly gave me that, which is which is great. So that's that's a, that's one of my favourites, um, just because of its um, just because of the story, you know. Um, but yeah, I know I've, I've, I've photographed. Oh my God! In my career, eighty five, I started. I photographed ten thousand families. I mean, I've, I've photographed so many families that you just could not you could not believe. And I've been in the lucky. Uh, circumstance to meet some you know amazing people do you know I, I photographed Jackie Stewart and I photographed John Hart and I photographed Vivian Westwood and I, I don't know and, and when you're you're sort of one one one, one with these people and it's it, it's really strange but I photographed Jackie Stewart I, I did it at Glen Eagles and when I arrived there this this is his assistant met me and he goes are you Kenny I said hi he says Mr Stewart's waiting for you up and he's sweet and I goes that's great and we went up the stairs and he came to the door and, and he goes, oh, Kenny, I, Jackie, he says, uh, you got 45 minutes. And then that's, uh, I said, 45, I've never had 45 minutes to take a picture of something. <laughs> Normally I get like two minutes. 
and I've got him maybe do the test shot with his assistant and then he comes in and I do the photograph and then off he goes. He's 45 minutes, so we had this amazing chat. And he said to me, <laughs> he said, uh, tell me this. I said, what? He said, have you really won a Kodak Gold Award? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, I went, aye. He said, that's amazing. And I went, I, I didn't even know, how did he know about it? Did he check it up? Did he look, look it up? I, was, I don't know, right? Because there wasn't any internet at the time. And I'm thinking, hang on, I'm with Jackie Stewart here. And he's asking me if I've won a Kodak Gold Award. Anyway, so that was fine. He's the only guy that I've ever had to have a written contract with that I photographed prior to the shoot. And the contract says that if he wanted to buy any photographs from the session, that it'd be at cost price. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, oh, fair enough, right? right? What's the chances I want to buy any anyway? So that was the thing. So I did, I did the session and then I came back and one of the pictures just really jumped out at me. It's a really powerful picture. And I sent it in for the code that gold awards and I won a code that gold award. So I contacted him, and there was no internet at the time, so I phoned him up, and he was staying in Neon in Switzerland at the time, and I said, I've won a code that gold award, what are your pictures? And he went, that's amazing. So I sent him a copy of the picture. Then I got a phone call for his secretary, and she says, Jackie would like to order 10, 10 by 8 glosses, black and white glosses, on the picture. And I said, I no problem. So I then remembered his, he wants about cost price. <laughs> so at the, t- at the time, I think I, char- I, would, I was charging about £40 for 10B at the time. It was way back in the 90s. So it was about £40 for a 10B. I thought, no, if I charge my five or five of each, that'll be fine. So I, I did that. I put the invoice in there and I sent them in the post. And two weeks later, I got a phone call for the. <laughs> I got a phone call from the secretary. And she said, um, oh, Jackie's delighted with the pictures, by the way. It's great. She says, but he's had a look at the invoice and he's done a wee bit of research and he's found out that actually it's closer to £3.50. <laughs> Jackie Stewart, right? Multi millionaire. That's why he's a multi millionaire, by the way. So I had to, I had to be invoice him for three months. <laughs> Kenny, thank you so, so much. That was just brilliant. Thank you, my dear. <laughs> if you go to my website, all these pictures are on it, by the way. So it's my website and it's Expressions of Scotland section. And there's, there's about 60 different Scottish personalities, Ricky Fulton and uh, Gerard Kelly, who sadly died now. So they're from all the um, Kenny Dalgleish and all that kind of stuff. So have a wee look at that. There's some interesting pictures there. All photographed by daylight, by the way. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just scanning, Kenny. I don't think I can see anyone else Good. Um, waving at me. Good. Can maybe nobody else? Maybe ask Gavin. Gavin, would you mind um, thanking Kenny for us all, please? Certainly. Well, yes. Well, Kenny, we are, as a community, are delighted that you came to stay in Tweesmere, and we are now being so privileged to see some of your fantastic photography. I mean, I must admit, it's been tremendous. Uh, me, personally, I think I need an awful lot more than 10 hints to improve my photography, but it's been a, it's a great start. <laughs> <laughs> It's been very, very interesting, and I'm sure lots of people around about Vision Work, it'll just get them going and get them all started. I'm hoping that's the, the, the original idea. Excellent. I'd also like to point out, I think we are very lucky as to where we stay, because looking again at some of your photographs, there's so much just very close to us round about that yeah. should inspire lots of people around about here to go and take some photographs of. Uh, it's been a fantastic oh. night, so thank yeah. you very much. I was so just like to finish off with saying, Jackie Stewart, you've got to remember it's Scottish. That's why it was £3.50 rather than a fiver. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for a tremendous night. It was great. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kenny. Thanks, Kenny. Good. Is that us? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> just, just before we do, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the, this place is that's one of the reasons to move here. It's It's absolutely phenomenal for photography it really is it's absolutely phenomenal i mean to be able to get the top of talent in seven minutes you know <laughs> it, it's it's incredible uh, you know through it, just all over the place even that little bridge down there is phenomenal you know uh, there's there's so much inspiration in this place and um, no, no 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 doubt at all so yeah get, get out of there start, start mm-hmm. to teach. 
start to take your phone with you. Start to, you know, keep your phone in your pocket all the time and start to take more photographs. That, that's, that's the key. Get your eye in. <laughs> Good. Listen, thank you much. Thank you very much, everybody, for, for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.